welcome to Soil Seminar. Uh, just a reminder for those that are coming in that we are going to be recording today. Also, the, the format for today's presentation will be uh, a little bit unique. So our presenter uh, will not be sharing uh, a slide, but instead he'll be using his video screen for the entire presentation. So I'll pin that in a moment. So uh, it'll stay at the top for everybody, but keep an eye on that. Uh, our presenter for today is Chandra Farhadiglu. He's a native of Turkey and he has a passion for agriculture and soil science. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in soil science and plant nutrition from Actinez University in 2015. He received his master's degree in soil science from North Carolina State University in 2019. And now he is working on a PhD in soil science with uh, Dr. Bradley Miller. And with that, uh, I welcome Channer. Thank you, Matthew, for this great presentation. Does everybody see my screen and myself? I think so. All right. So I want to welcome everybody. And I want to do it with a positive vibe here. And if you guys are ready, let's get started. So I am looking forward to diving into the background behind game theory today. And this game theory is used to explain black box machine learning algorithms that are used in digital soil mapping. They create some problems. I mean, black box machine learning algorithms create problems because they are not explainable. And we'll go through what kind of prog problems can be stemmed from them and how we can use game theory to, to interpret them. So let's get started with the background information. Uh, I said that we use machine learning. So let's, let me give the definition first. It is a type of artificial intelligence enabling self-learning from data when it is fed it and uh, that learning is used to make new predictions without human intervention. And uh, this is used in digital soil mapping um, as the computer assisted production of digital soil maps for different soil types and soil properties. And our outcome is pixelated raster images. Let's get to it uh, with a plot like that. So we should have to be able to do a digital soil mapping procedure, we should have two different data sets. First one is uh, this one, georeferenced training points. Each point has X and Y coordinates, long longitude and latitude. And each point has an attribute for soil lab analyses uh, for different properties, soil organic matter, phosphorus, potassium. And you have covariates. These are basically images from satellite imagery, digital train attributes, weather data like temperature data, um, rain data, rainfall. And this should be relevant to soil forming factors like parent material, topography, climate, organisms, and time. And we pair this georeferenced uh, sample data with the corresponding pixel values from the, of, of the covariates, train a model, which is predictive model here, and then use that model to uh, produce soil maps in our study area. And this predictive model is basically machine learning model. And this machine learning model could be a complex black box model like deep neural networks, random forest, and they are robust, which means that uh, they have the ability to perform well when they are tested on a new data set, but their interpretability lacks, which means that we cannot comprehend the machine learning model and we cannot present therefore the underlying basis for uh, our predictions. So it is opaque. But on the other hand, simple models like the most basic model, linear regression model, they are interpretable somewhat, but their robustness lack, especially with complex data sets, modern data sets. And this creates a tension between uh, interpretability and robustness. So let's get to what creates black box situation for black box machine learning algorithms. So we pass the input into the algorithm, the box like that, but we don't know how the covariates are input data used combined to make predictions. 
and it is opaque, not clear. And we get the output. It is um, it might be highly robust, but we don't know the process. It could be artificial neural networks or deep learning algorithms. And here's the hidden layers in the between. This is the black box. You pass your input, something is happening here in the between, and you'll get the predictions. And it is created by the situation that there are so many interactions, as you can see, lots of lines, uh, weights are assigned, and also lots of iterations are done called back propagation to increase the prediction accuracy in these uh, neural networks. Likewise, random forest. In random forest, like you see in this line, hundreds of trees are created, decision trees. They could be regression, they could be classification. And then uh, predictions from each tree is combined and the final prediction is created called average predictions. But how this averaging is done and what was uh, what is the important tree, we cannot summarize that, even the experts. And that creates the black box situation generally. But on the other hand, we have linear regression model. They are more interpretable because uh, somewhat we can see the equation that creates this model. So why is here the organic matter, let's say, or phosphorus? You have beta zero bias, beta one to beta n, these are coefficients for corresponding covariates, which are x1, x2, or xn. But what are the components here we can play around with? They are basically coefficients, like beta one, beta two, uh, until beta n, because, uh, Sorry, because for example, beta one is zero, let's say zero here, your X one wouldn't have any impact in the model, which is your uh, one of your covariates. Therefore, uh, they are in practice, uh, very related to model interpretability. And model interpretability in practice is equal to coefficient, uh, coefficient times standard deviation of corresponding covariate. And this results in covariate importance, like seen here. So we compare the standardized coefficients to understand what covariates were important. And they are usually represented as bar plots. So here we have covariates and the longer the bar, the more average impact each covariate would have on the model. But why do we care about that? Because if you ask me to swallow a black pill without me asking what is in it, I would probably not do that unless I am a crazy person. And likewise, black box machine learning, uh, learning algorithms don't have interpretations. We don't know how the predictions are created. So this makes the adoption of them harder. So you can think of the interpretation of a black box machine learning as the label of a bottle of black pills. And when we get a more transparent interpretable model, some of the benefits include end users can more easily understand why the certain predictions were made. And developers can find uh, the bugs in the model, the problems, and more easily debug and optimize the machine learnings used to digitally map soils. And project managers more, e uh, more easily comprehend the technical aspect of uh, the, the project. And likewise, digital soil mappers, um, we want to, more particularly, we want to make connections between our covariates and our predictions to avoid spurious correlation, correlations, uh, non-existent correlations. So let's more explicitly state the problem. It is the lack in interpretability of machine learning models. And our goal is to use an, a type of analysis that makes this black box machine learning algorithms more transparent. And they should provide model explanations and covariate importance. So we have some criterion um, to evaluate our success in this case which is the local explanations, which is the, the model explanations. And it is the report of the direction of influence for each covariate on individual predictions. 
So we want to see that if that covariate is making the prediction higher or lower numerically. And global summary, the quantification of the global importance of covariates in the model. So we have game theory. And game theory, and also I put SHAP here because SHAP is a tool that utilizes game theory. And with that theory, we will try to interpret our black box machine learning algorithms. It is a tool. So let me first introduce Lloyd Shapley. Lloyd Shapley was an American mathematician and Nobel Prize winning economist. And he was the father of this game theory idea. And Scott Lundberg, he is a senior researcher uh, of Microsoft Corporation. There were some tools utilizing game theory before Scott came up with this SHAP tool in 2017, but he unified all these approaches and uh, came up with a more robust algorithm called SHAP. So let's first uh, talk about what is game theory. It is a mathematical study of conflict and cooperation. What does that mean? which means that it means that there are players and there is a game. Think about a football game. There are players here and there's an outcome. And we want to know the marginal contribution of each player. And this is according to their marginal productivity to the expected outcome. Let's say that in a football game, there is Brady and there are other players. For example, Brady's contribution would be expected to be more on the winning situation in the football game. And others are also should be calculated as well. But it is all about their productivity level in the outcome. And each player gets a Shapley value for their importance. And it is uh, calculated through weighting each marginal contribution on average and it is about all possible orderings of players being equally likely. And the players here are our covariates in digital soil mapping. So we want to see their importance in the predictions. Let's continue and uh, let's talk a little bit about the SHAP, uh, SHAP's local explanations. SHAP provides local explanations with creating a linear model uh, after the original model is uh, trained without peeking into what is going on inside of the original model, but tries to interpret without peeking into the black box machine learning algorithm. And it does it efficiently. Um, let me show you uh, the equation for SHAP. This is the equation of SHAP. As you can see that it is very similar to linear regression algorithm equation. So this is beta zero bias basically. Here is phi i times z i, uh, and is the uh, beta one uh, would be equivalent to beta one and x one, and it is the contribution of each feature. And z is uh, either zero or one, depending on if that covariate or value, data value, makes any difference in the outcome. If it doesn't make any difference, it is basically zero value. If it makes, it is binary value one. And M is the number of simplified input features. And uh, phi i is the importance. We'll get to it. So this model is a local surrogate model of the original model. And uh, this z i is, like I said, uh, it is uh, created uh, through a simple model. And it is a binary value. Is that something wrong? All right, I'm going to continue. And uh, because there is a, another simple model is created to, create it to measure the effect of that covariate, uh, because of that, this uh, uh, SHAP is computationally very uh, efficient. It doesn't take much time to do SHAP analysis. And uh, phi is that how much the presence of covariate pixel value contributes to the final prediction here. And this feature, each feature here is the covariate pixel value, which is the local, which is gonna lead to the local explanations, which I'm gonna get to. And this the outcome of this GZ model, Shap's model should be equal to FX, nothing more or nothing less. Therefore we can mimic the original model. Okay, 
local explanations using this uh, equation uh, phi i is calculated and it is exactly like the Shapley value from game theory but what how, how it is done let's see uh, let's understand this with a short story imagine that you have three friends namely David Madison and Rob they are playing a prize uh, winning puzzle game David scores 50 and he earns 50 bucks for this score. Then Madison joins, two of them together scores 80. And then Rob joins, three of them together scores 90. So I'm asking, would the price that Madison would be earning is 30? And for Rob it is 10? Well, probably not, because maybe Rob would be scoring 80 on his own, right? Therefore, you have to do all these orderings, permutations to see their real value, real contribution to the expected outcome. So SHAP local explanations do that particularly. And each person here is the single pixel value of covariance data point. So I'm gonna get to it. Um, and SHAP values attribute to each feature the change in the expected model prediction when conditioning on that feature and the SHAP values arise from the averaging process of phi i values across all possible orderings. And you get a plot like that. So these are the covariates and then they are for a particular data point in the map, for example, like that. So let's say that this is your prediction map and you have pixels, right? And you have another pixel here and you find this interesting and you want to find out what is important to make such prediction. Sorry, it's a bad pixel. They should have same sides. Okay. So here, these are the uh, corresponding pixel for the covariates. The red ones here for this prediction are pushing the prediction upward numerically. And the outcome is 4.01 soil organic matter because I'm trying to predict soil organic matter here. And this blue one here is pulling the prediction downward numerically. And the final prediction is 4.01. I mean, they don't do anything because you can, they cannot change the prediction, but they are trying to understand the causes of that prediction. So we call that as local explanations. Let's continue. <clears throat> and also there are global summary and they are the average covariate importance. And it is done through retraining the SHAP model on all covariate subsets. And simultaneously, two different models are run. One with uh, that feature included in the model. And uh, the second one without that feature is not included. That way you can see the difference in the outcome. Um, and you can say that this is the importance of that covariate. And the differences are computed for all possible subsets for each covariate. And based on a weighted average of all possible differences and Shapley values are created, calculated and used as covariate importance globally in your model. But there are some assumptions of SHAP but, and they are important. So there are two optional assumptions for both local and global techniques, methods I'm, I just uh, talked about. First, covariates are independent, meaning that they are not correlated. And second one, model linearity is assumed because you want to simplify the computation uh, of uh, Shapley values. And But what if there is the relationship between the input data and the predictions is not linear for the Shap's model? and or uh, covariates are not independent. In that situation, the permutations are important because the model is not linear anymore. So the ordering of them will matter. And all these permutations, orderings of SHAP will take care of and find out the real value of each covariate uh, of the original model. Okay. So I did a case study, uh, a digital soil mapping um, study uh, project, and I used SHAP to interpret uh, my model. Let's get to it. 
So this is our study field. In this smaller map, in the large map, um, I show the location of my map, uh, my field. And it is somewhere close to Boone, between Boone and Ames. It's a small field, half an hectare. And I used 45 samples for soil organic matter to map soil organic matter. And I used random forest regressor and I came up with this map. In this map, bluish areas are showing uh, soil organic matter content, um, lower soil organic matter content, and reddish and yellowish areas are showing higher soil organic matter percentage or content. And I validated the, po uh, the, the map using validation points. So I trained the model and then I used out of bag samples to validate my model. My metrics were R squared, RMSE, root mean squared error, mean absolute error, and concordance correlation coefficient. And these are the values uh, that I got as a result. First, you should be satisfied with your uh, validation because no one wants to interpret a bad performing uh, model, right? So first, make sure that you are satisfied. Then let's get to sharp local explanations. So I want to um, show the local explanations for this map again, the same map. And here, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to explain um, that um, in between um, yellow, um, green uh, prediction point, okay? And I'm showing red covariates pushing the Final prediction upward, 4.01 is our final prediction for that particular prediction in the map. And this blue covariate is pulling the prediction downward numerically. And you rotate this uh, plot 90 degrees uh, like that and stack that for each prediction point and you would get a plot like this one. And this would show the trends for all your predictions and you can easily interpret what is going on um, in this map and the model. Let's continue. And here I'm showing a sharp global covariate importance. I showed a similar uh, plot before, and basically these are the covariates, and uh, the longer the, the bar, the higher the importance, higher the mean sharp value, honestly, and the average impact on the model output. Okay. Let's get to the benefit of interpretability uh, in a more solid way. So we have another plot resulted from SHAP and it combines local and global interpretations or explanations. So here you, you see again, like um, the most important covariate from top to down, the lowest important covariate and you see uh, validation points for each line. And red, uh, red color is referring to high soil organic matter prediction and blue is showing lower uh, soil organic matter prediction at that point. And let's look at this covariate, how we can interpret that. This covariate S17, 127 in the SVI, this is a covariate about or showing uh, in the map, uh, the density of plant residue or dying plants. It is normalized different senescent vegetation index because. And as we can see that uh, on this uh, X axis, um, SHAP value, if this SHAP value is higher, it means that uh, the, the covariate value is, this covariate is positively correlated to the outcome at for, uh, for these predictions like bluish. So we see that higher, uh, the more plant residue or dying plants you have in the map or in the field, lower soil organic matter content you would expect at that point. And less dying plants or plant residue in the field, you would expect higher amount of soil organic matter, right? So this is telling you this one and highly um, clear to see through the model, even though it is a black box model. Okay, we are almost done. Let's talk about the conclusions. SHAP can be used to interpret black box machine learning algorithms used in digital soil mapping by providing local explanations for each predictions 
and global summary of covariate importance. And um, as a future work, I am planning to map nitrate, phosphorus, potassium, soil organic matter, and buffer pH for 10 fields within egg engineering and agronomy research farm, uh, which is uh, close to Boone, a little bit outside Ames, and explain the models used to map these properties using SHAP analyses and compare my findings. Okay. Um, I want to thank Department of Agronomy for the funding they have been giving me. Really appreciate that. And the Lightroom uh, for this great facility located in the Department of Agronomy at um, Iowa State University. I also want to uh, thank so much uh, my major professor, um, dear Dr. Bradley Miller, for his um, great advising. And Meyer Bond for digital train attributes or derivatives. It was critical because um, the more covariates you get, the more possibility I would have to find relevant predictors for my soil properties. So thank you so much, Meyer. And I want to thank every each member of um, GEO, um, my lab, and for their support and soil sampling data. I really appreciate that. And last but not the least, Glenn Weidenhoff and Tyler Price uh, have helped me uh, about this Lightboard Studio. And without them, this cool presentation would not be possible. And I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you, Chandra, very much. That's a, a really exciting presentation and uh, an awesome format. Uh, are there any questions for Channer? Channer, this is Madi Alcasey. Hello, Dr. Matthew. Hi. Alcasey. Nice presentation. Great job. I have a couple of questions or really clarification. When you rank your co independent covariant, what's the process? you go through to rank these covariants. It's a backward elimination. What do you use, what a process? So what I do is that first, uh, this is not included in this presentation, but I try to um, select them. I mean, before selecting them backward or forward, I try to, um, I eliminate highly correlated covariates and leave only one of them. Let's say that 10 highly, uh, correlated covariates, I leave nine of them out and uh, stay with only one of them because basically they have uh, the same or very similar information. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I use different feature selection techniques um, like backward, forward, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Al -Kaysen. Uh, this is Andrew Manu. Uh, what, what criterion do you use to select? You know, you have these covariates, or uh, the independent variables, and then you look at the correlation and you say, well, uh, these things are intercorrelated. Which, uh, what method do you use to choose the right one? That's a great question, uh, Dr. Manu, honestly. First, I use the criteria point eight. Any covariate having a correlation uh, at the level of 0.8, I find, for example, one, two, three, four, five, I remove four of them and stay with only this one. And then I also use uh, ANOVA. ANOVA outputs F values. And this is basically uh, showing uh, how high correlation you would have uh, between your covariates. I think I think like that. And this is your target, let's say soil organic matter, right? And your covariates here. So I look at one to one uh, um, F values between like one covariate at a time, one time, and then one uh, target. And then depending on how high this is, like I choose the highest ones and you can set a criteria like I wanna choose 
10 of them, I want to choose 20 covariates, then you have to use this in machine learning models and compare their uh, performance. Otherwise, uh, there is no way that you can know that 10 covariate is better than 20 when it is run in machine learning models. Did I answer your question, Dr. Menu? Yes, sir. Uh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Menu. Let me raise that. And any other questions? Uh, Chandler, I have another question. Sure, Dr. Alvarez. You. In your presenta presentation in the shop, assumption that the independent variables, they are uh, uh, or the covariant, they are independent linearity. Mm -hmm. When yes. we think about the natural process and you look at averaging, you have a tree, you presented tree of averages and, and you average the three tree of averages to come up with the general average. How do you weigh the variability across the field when you have different soil texture, spatial variability, different vegetation cover? How you factor that in in the learning machine process? That's a... Uh... Very good question, um, Dr. L. Casey. I don't know if I can answer, but I'll try. So here we have a covariate for, um, let's say, for a satellite, uh, for NDVI, let's say, normalized difference vegetation showing the mm. vigor of vegetation basically in the field. And this is a pixelated map again. And you have point data here that you use to train the algorithm, right? So the machine learning finds the pattern with this, like there are pixels here, like there's a pixel here, there's a pixel here, because this is composed of pixels. Let's say that NDVI, as we know that it, it ranges between minus one and one. Mm -hmm. um, let's say that there is high um, um, uh, vigor vegetation here, and it is 0.8 right and um, our soil organic matter for example we are trying to predict soil organic matter mm -hmm. let's say and it is 4.5 we do that for training uh, locations and find the pattern if this ndvi is well correlated on the prediction sorry uh, training points that way that this explains this COVID explains, can explain the variation for soil organic matter we are trying to predict. And similar uh, approach is done uh, for uh, any type of property that you are trying to predict. It could be texture as well. Mm -hmm. okay. did, did I answer, Dr. Al Casey? Yes, somehow I'm kind of conflicted when, uh, you know, if, if you just put aside the assumption of the learning machine and the process, when you want to determine, let's say, organic matter content across parcel of field, you take these values and then you wait for each area. Let's say you have half an acre, you have 4.5. One acre have uh, five and, and so on. So you weigh the averages of these different parcels and you come up with a general value of the entire field. So I know it's a complex process, mm -hmm. how that handle in the, in the algorithm of the machine learning, that's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, if if I understood you correctly, um, you might be talking about a spatial interpolation techniques. They are also another approach and they use, for example, you have points like that again, like points. And here 
whatever property you are trying to predict, it is 4.2. This is like 3.5, for example. And based on that values, uh, if they are closer to each other, they are more similar. And if they are farther apart from each other, for example, uh, this one to that one, then um, the spatial interpolation would do accordingly because this would be this similar, this, this point and that point. Are you talking about that, Dr. Al Casey? Yes, yes, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Al Casey. I think that um, Michael Thompson has a question for you, Channer. Yes. Hi, uh, I have a question that um, I, maybe I should know the answer to this, but I just don't. So it has to do with the two techniques that you chose not to use. Uh, that is a uh, random forest model. And um, let's see, what was the other one now? Neural network. Would it be fair to say that in those two cases, the models don't really care about uh, autocorrelation or correlation between the variables? In fact, they, they ignore that possibility. And, and so one reason that your approach might be more uh, interpretable is because you're trying to you're trying to keep the variables separated as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, autocorrelation. Um, I, I shouldn't so have used autocorrelation. That was the wrong word. I'm really trying to focus on those two models: the random forest and the neural networks. Do they assume that there is no? Do they try to? Um, do they assume that there is no correlation between the variables that are used to create predictions? Uh, are you asking um, that among covariates or covariates to, or the autocorrelate, sorry, uh, the distribution of soil organic matter separately? Well, let's see. I'm thinking of the two assumptions that you made for for the machine learning approach that you're taking, which uses a regression approach. And the, the, those one of the two assumptions was that there would be no correlation among the variables used to make a prediction. No, no I want to I want to correct something. Oh, good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Please correct yeah. my what I, I wanna, what I understood. I want to correct myself honestly because those assumptions are the explanation models assumptions like Shap's uh, assumptions because so you have your input data here input you train a, a machine learning and you get uh, predictions predictions for this, I didn't mention those assumptions are not for this machine learning algorithm for making the original predictions, but they are for the SHAP model that is mimicking the original model to um, come up with the explanations, importance of the covariates. Like those two assumptions is for SHAP, not for the original uh, predictive model. Ah, okay. But uh, also the autocorrelation situation, uh, the random forest doesn't take into account a spatial autocorrelation of uh, training points, for example, because in nature, uh, close, uh, if things are closer to each other, they're expected to be similar. And- sure. uh, and random forest and uh, ANN, um, as far as I know, they don't uh, consider that uh, approach. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Appreciated the questions. Are there any other questions for Channer? Okay, seeing that, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, if, if there's no other question, I'm interested, Chandler, if you, what's your confidence 
and the predictability of this model and have you did any ground truthing to look at the actual measurement value versus the predicted values? I did, I did talk to Okay, so let me go back to the slide that I'm showing uh, the validation, if you don't mind. So here, for this map, uh, I said that there are 45 samples, 45 samples, and five of them were not included in the model uh, building process, but 40 of them were used to build the model, predictive model. This is because uh, of the fact that uh, the model doesn't know about this five. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can use this five. Uh, they are basically the green, um, like this symbol, uh, plus symbol. Mm -hmm. So these, these were not used in the model. And when I compared my actual values of these five points, and then um, the pixel values, basically the predictions that you see the prediction map, so the R squared value was 0.75 um, and root mean squared error was 0.35. And also more, uh, more interestingly, uh, coefficient, um, sorry, concordance correla um, correlation coefficient, they look at the, um, the correlation between actual values and the predictions. Um, at the, uh, the basis of 45 uh, degree um, basis. I mean, like one to one comparison. Mm -hmm. It could be as high as one and it could be as low as minus one, but not the same like R squared. There is another range of evaluation and 0.9 is considered to be very high, for example, the agreement. And I keep doing more experiments and uh, keep getting more validation point uh, results like that and hoping to get higher predictions, um, sorry, validation results. Yeah, the, the, the only question I have, you selected five values to validate or compare it to the predicted values. I was wondering if that's, size of <clears throat> sample is good enough to give you a good accuracy or confidence and the predictability may be increasing the size of sample? Yes, uh, so I kind of something, yeah. but um, so here I use, um, sorry, 80% it depends on how many samples you have for uh, fields. I have um, sample quantity ranging from 45 to 160 samples. Mm -hmm. And I have 80% training and 20% uh, validation points. Okay. And in this case, uh, I think five, divided by 45 would be close to 10%. So I have this and also I have five and other points for testing the model itself in the um, validating the model itself, but this is independent validation. So I have two different validations, testing and independent validation, uh, spatially like seen uh, in this map. Okay. Thank you, Chana. Thank you, Dr. Alcasey. Appreciated the questions. So, so Chainer, if you don't mind me jumping in to, uh, to ask a follow-up question to Dr. Alcasey's questions, mm -hmm. how sure. much do you expect the, the model to stay the same from one field to the next? And does, does Shapley give you any, any tools in that regard? Uh, without trying, um, it is hard to guess that, but therefore, uh, for example, I trained a model here and I will try that model in a different field. I haven't done that yet, but I'm hoping that um, um, to get a higher prediction uh, validation results. And also I got a chance to compare uh, the global summaries of SHAP um, for two different models. For example, for this field, modeling this field, 
and another field. And I saw that there were similar um, uh, covariates were uh, the most important ones. So this may lead to some discovery uh, and um, showing something that machine learning is capturing. Did, did I answer your question, Dr. Miller? It's a good start, but you and I have lots of time together. So I'll have more <laughs> questions for you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Miller. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Any other questions for Channer? Okay, well, seeing none, I'll uh, again thank everybody for coming today and uh, let you know that, that uh, next week, uh, Erica Marin Spiotto will be presenting from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, correct, Bradley? Yes. Yes, and her title, uh, Out of Sight, Out of Mind, Below Ground Response to Environmental Change and Cultural Transformations in the Geosciences. Uh, so look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Much. Good job, Chandler. Thank you, Dr. Al Casey. See you around. See you.